Our first speaker for the afternoon is Danielle Lantain. She is an environmental engineer currently working at the Center for Disease Control and Prevention and pursuing her PhD at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Upon finishing her undergraduate degree, she worked for five years at the Ipswich River Watershed Association and taught at the Edgerton Center at MIT. She began working in household water treatment in developing countries during her master's and continued teaching in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at MIT, as well as doing private consulting until 2003. She moved full time to the CDC in May of 2003. In her three years at MIT and seven years with the CDC, she has worked to implement and study chlorination, filtration, and combined treatment household water treatment implementations in over 40 countries. Lantain is a member of the Board of Directors for Potters for Peace. Please join me in welcoming Danielle Lantain. Thank you, it's great to be here, and I'll attempt to keep you awake after the fabulous lunch. Um, so, I wanna start today just by introducing a picture. This was snapped about 10 kilometers north of the capital city of Maputo, of Mozambique, which is Maputo. Maputo has a pipe-treated infrastructure water system that provides water to its residents. Um, but that system does not operate 24-7. It does not operate full-time. Uh, operates a couple days a week for a couple hours. And this is a woman who has access to the system, who's gone to a river to collect water in a jerry can. She's carrying uh, 20 liters, which is 44 pounds of water on her head. She's walking about a mile from her home to do this. And on her back is a child. And I just wanna highlight this picture because this is really the target market of who we're looking to work with. And often in developing countries, women are both responsible for water collection, water treatment, water management in the home, as well as responsible for the diarrhea and caretaking of children when they get sick. And so I'll start a little bit with the health background rather than the water. Um, why do children die of diarrhea? Diarrhea is not a disease you think of that kills. You get diarrhea, worst case scenario, you might lose a couple pounds. That's kind of a good thing for me. Now, why do kids die? And it's not that they die of diarrhea. The kids who die of diarrhea are the youngest children. They have immature immune systems, and they have less physiological reserve. Essentially, they have less weight to lose. And they have multiple physiological insults. They don't just have diarrhea. They're also malnourished, protein caloric deficiencies. There might be micronutrient deficiencies, iron, zinc, vitamin A, and they're exposed to frequent infections, not just diarrhea, but malaria, um, acute respiratory infections, other bacteria, viruses. And they live in a feces contaminated environment where your water, your food, and your environment is contaminated with the feces of other people. When you put that together with the fact that these children often have limited access to effective clinical care, you get death from diarrhea. So we often ask ourselves the questions, how many child deaths are due to unsafe water? How many child deaths a year are due to diarrhea? And this question really ignores the fact that there's a web of causality. You don't die just from diarrhea. You die from the combination of diarrhea, um, malnutrition, unsafe medical care, and it assumes there's a single cause of death. And it actually also risks professional groups arguing for one another. Diarrhea is more important than HIV because more kids die of it. Um, diarrhea is more, uh, malaria is more important than diarrhea. You end up with professional groups fighting for access to limited resources and not collaborating for an integrated child health management uh, way to address the problem. And so what we can say is that child mortality from diarrhea is an enormous global health problem and contaminated water contributes importantly. If you want actual numbers, the latest study says that 1.87 million kids die of diarrhea a year, and it's the third largest cause of death of kids worldwide. What are the two biggest causes of death before diarrhea? Anybody know? Got some guesses? What's the biggest killer of kids worldwide? What? Not, 
uh, diarrhea is really the health impact from water, so that one's kind of included in there. Biggest cause of death for kids worldwide is actually neonatal causes. You die in the first couple of weeks or months after birth from infections or because of maternal mortality. If the mother dies in childbed, the child often follows. So if you make it through the first couple of weeks or months, the next biggest cause of death is actually acute respiratory infections, pneumonia, caused in large part by indoor cooking stoves and indoor cooking. You just cough. Third largest cause of death is diarrhea. Fourth is malaria. Are any of those sexy diseases? Or any of those HIV or Ebola or loss of fever? All of those are preventable. All of those we know how to treat. All of those are virtually eradicated in the developed world. So what we're looking at is a huge amount of mortality that comes from diseases that we know how to treat. It's just a matter of how do we do that. So another number from World Health Organization, how much disease could be prevented by better managing water sanitation and hygiene? And the estimate is that 10% of the worldwide burden of disease could be could be eliminated if you improve the watt sand hygiene situation worldwide. So right now, water sanitation and hygiene leads to a cycle that encourages disease and poverty. If you have an inadequate water supply and unsafe water resources and an inequitable access, you spend more of your valuable time and money in order to get access to water, which then is a cycle that leads to keeping people in poverty. If you provide access to improved water supply and safe water and resources, then you lead more toward a development type of situation that leads to time and financial savings and averted disease costs. This is using Watson as a motor of development. In the previous presentation, a slide was put up looking at how, many, um, how much money you make back by investing in Watson. For every dollar you put in, there's various estimates. You can get between the estimates kind of range from about $15 to $100 back as a return on that investment by investing in what's in developing countries. So what is safe drinking water? What's water that prevents diarrhea? Well, if you talk to health workers from the CDC, they'll talk a lot about water that doesn't cause morbidity or mortality, death or disease, in kids that are under five. That's the big metric. If you talk to engineers where I was trained in water treatment years ago, they'll tell you, well, I treat it in this box, and when it leaves this box in a pipe, if it doesn't have bacteria in it, it's clean. And if you talk to the people who make the worldwide development goals, the Millennium Development Goals, which were set up in 2000 for 2015, they'll say a person has access to safe water if they use what's called an improved source. Now, an improved source is essentially just a water source that has some type of engineering around it. It's not a spring coming out of the ground. You put a cap on that spring. It's not a hole in the ground that's a well. You put a pipe on that. Um, none of these actually addresses the question of, is the water in the user's cup safe to drink? You can be drinking completely fecally contaminated water coming out of an infrastructure pipe just as easily as you could be drinking safe water out of a spring. So the goal, actually, for the Millennium Development Goals is to reduce in half those without access to improved water by 2015. Now, it was estimated in 2000 when this goal was set up that about 1.3 billion people-ish did not have access to an improved water source. It was, if you take a bigger number, looking at how many people drink unsafe drinking water, that's probably about 2 billion. So if you look at those in about 2000, now if we meet this goal, if we actually declare success, there's still over 625 million people with out access to an improved water source, and many more than that drinking unsafe and contaminated water. So our goals are, are, are a little bit suspect. So one of the things we want to highlight is that safe water is water that's safe to drink in the user's cup. When we test water in households in developing countries, we ask the mother of the household to provide us a cup of water the way she would give to her child. And this is the cup of water we got in rural Ethiopia. And this is not tea, but just the drinking water that's in the region. This is the water that we need to make sure is safe to prevent child death. Okay, so how did we do this in developed countries? Uh, in 1896, chlorine was discovered. In the late 1800s and the early 1900s, the big infrastructure systems came online. The infrastructure systems um, essentially started filtering 
and chlorinating their drinking water. This is a picture from Pitts, Philly. Actually, this one's Philly. The Philly, um, years across the bottom, number of typhoid cases. I'm not sure how many people know, but in the US, New York, Philadelphia, London, the big cities had huge cholera and typhoid outbreaks in the 18 and early 1900s. So this is typhoid, a, diarrheal, a bacterial diarrheal disease. You can see that before filtration at the water treatment plant in 1906, there was about 10,000 cases per year. There was a 90% reduction once filtration was implemented to about 1,000 cases per year. And again, after chlorination came in seven years later, there was another 90% reduction. This is how we virtually eliminated diarrheal disease in the, um, in the developed world, is we put in large cell infrastructure plants that filter and chlorinate to remove the bacteria, viruses, and protozoa that cause diarrheal disease. Now the question is, can this be done? I mean, there's a good question. I don't know how much you've talked about it in this conference, but is this even sustainable in the US is a good question. But then there's also a question of what do we do in the developed world? So this is one of those maps that shows you based on scale and it reorders the world. This shows the world according to diarrhea. So you see that there's some countries that really pop out. India, um, so this is a size and proportion of the absolute number of people who have died from diarrhea. India, number one. You see Nigeria, the country there at the corner of the Horn of Africa, where you see the, um, the yellow one, that's Nigeria. The big red one, Democratic Republic of Congo, a place that's been in emergency context for a long time. And you see virtually eliminated is, uh, is North and South America and Europe. So how do we reduce this burden of disease? We have looked and tried, and there's been many programs to put large-style infrastructure into the, development into the developing country context. And unfortunately, that large-style infrastructure has not succeeded particularly well. It has to do with the fact that there are demands to do large-style infrastructure. You need a stable government and a stable monetary system that can then invest quite a bit of money up front to assume that there'll be a long-term benefit and users will pay for that benefit over time. There's a return on your investment over years. You also need the right geography. You also need maintenance. You need operations. You need spare parts. You need people to run the systems. And there's quite a few systems. Actually, Port-au-Prince, Haiti, has a stunning water treatment system that was put in by the United States, um, as gorgeous as any system we have here. And they, the first thing to break down was all the chlorinators. So there's 13 chlorinators that chlorinate that water throughout the city. Those broke down because of maintenance issues and they couldn't get more chlorine to put in them. And so essentially, as that system degrades and degrades, and then further after the quake, of course, you end up with a non-working system. So there's been a move away from using kind of US-style imported infrastructure in the developing, con in the developed world, developing world context toward promotion of perhaps more appropriate interventions. The first is water supply. This is a very standard well. This is the India Mark II well. You see it across the world. Um, it's a hand pump, depending on the context, can kind of go 20 feet or lower. This is a well in Malawi. So we look at providing water supply to prevent diarrhea. We look at working with users to have them treat their water at the household level. This is with chlorine. This household has a bucket with a spigot and a lid and then a small bottle of chlorine that they treat their water at the household level with chlorine. This is a, a just very simple, um, made of locally materials, uh, a ventilated improved pit latrine. And then we also look at promotion of hygiene with hand washing. Now there's a huge debate within the academic circles, which is probably actually quite meaningless, as to which one of these reduces diarrhea the most. In 1992, there was a seminal study that came out that claimed that sanitation was the best at reducing diarrhea. It reduced diarrhea by 36%. Um, in 2004, there was another one that came out um, that said water treatment was best. It reduced diarrhea by 39% overall. I think this is a little bit of academic brouhaha um, because really every person in the world deserves all four of these. They deserve enough water. Uh, to, for the water supply needs, they deserve that water to be treated, and they deserve a place to defecate safely and in privacy, and they deserve um, they, to learn how to wash their hands. We need to figure out in where to start in each context. Clearly, if you don't have water, you start with water supply. 
Um, and so we need to start with one and then leverage to others. So I work mostly actually within, I do quite a bit of work in, in other things as well, but mostly I work within household water treatment and safe storage. And so the rest of the presentation will actually be focused on this. Um, so within household water treatment and safe storage, there are five options that have been shown in developing countries to reduce the disease burden and improve the microbiological quality of stored water. So the first of these options is ceramic filtration. This is a um, small locally made ceramic filter that you sit in a bucket and you pour water through it and as you pour the water through, it removes the bacteria and protozoa that cause diarrhea. The second is chlorination. Simply, this is a product from Madagascar. You fill one cap and add that to the local storage container and that will remove the bacteria and viruses that cause diarrhea. You can use the sunlight if you take a small um, plastic bottle that's less than 1.5 liters in size. You can put it on your roof in the sun for six hours if it's clear and 12 hours if it's cloudy in order to remove all the microorganisms that cause diarrhea through the combined effects of UV light and, um, and temperature. You can filter your water through a large container that's filled with sand, simple sand filtration. And you can use a commercial product such as this one by Procter & Gamble which is called Pure and it's a flocculant and a disinfectant. So you add this to 10 liters of water, you stir for five minutes, you let the water settle, you filter through a cloth, you wait for 10 minutes, or I'm sorry, then you wait for 20 minutes and the water's safe to drink. So these options, again, within these options, there's people heavily promoting each one. And one of the things to remember is each option has its space, each option has places where they work. No option in water and sanitation is the silver bullet. So if we look at comparing these options, chlorine reduces bacteria and viruses. It's been shown that people will use it in, the, in actual developing countries. It's proven to reduce disease. Uh, about, right now, about 18 million of these bottles are sold in East Africa each year at low cost. And um, that treats about 18 billion liters of water. So the scale here is, uh, is mostly in East Africa. And the cost is about 25 US cents to treat 1,000 liters of water if you use liquid, and about double that if you use a tablet version. If you look at filtration, filtration removes bacteria and protozoa. Uh, people will use it in the field. It's shown to reduce diarrheal disease. The biggest scale countries we have for people using filtration options to treat their household water are in um, Asia, Cambodia, Vietnam. Um, where there's a cultural history, India, of treating water with filtration, particularly with ceramics. Um, the cost of a filter is between eight and 100 US dollars. Now that's an upfront cost. And so you don't pay, you pay, it's only once until it breaks. So a very different model than a consumable, which you might have to buy every month or every other month. Solar disinfection, which is the bottles on your roof, removes bacteria, viruses, and protozoa, proven to work in the field, proven to work um, proven to have health impact. Quite a few programs in Latin America where there's a big foundation and it has no cost except for finding the plastic bottles. And Pure, which is the Procter & Gamble flo flocculent disinfectant, um, has removes bacteria, viruses, and protozoa, has been shown in the field that people will use it, particularly in the emergency context, but it has a much higher cost. It's 10 US cents for 10 liters of treatment. And so a lot of people would like to do a water treatment project, and there's a lot of um, different graphs and information about option selection, which one of these might be appropriate within the context you're within. And it's a very different thing. If you're an NGO with quite a bit of upfront money, say you're a Rotary Club and you want to donate something to a community, you might buy a pretty expensive filter because you have a lot more money that you have a one-time donation to give. If you're looking at something that you'd like a little bit more sustainable, you can work with people to, to provide a product that they can buy over time at a cost that can be afforded. So um, there's quite a few other options. About once a week I get an email from someone saying, I've done the hard part. I've developed a new water treatment um, device in the United States in my lab at such and such place. And now it's your job as a US government employee. You know, you do the easy part. You just get it to the 1.1 billion people who need it. And I get that 
probably once a week. Um, and the options are everything under the sun. You can't imagine what people try and sell you. Um, so we have kind of a rigorous method. We get this email and I have a standard response that says, okay, come back to me when you've tested it in the lab. Does it actually do what you say it does? And not in your lab at your company, but do it in an independent lab and get back to me. Have you taken it to the users and seen what they say? Have you tried to test it out? Um, when you put it in the DRC and it was your fancy filter for $50, did the rats eat the tubing and it didn't work anymore? which happens. Um, does it have a health impact? Does it work? And can we bring it to scale? I don't care if it's a perfect product for $250. I can't sell something or provide something to people in developed countries for $250 a family. So when we talk about option selection, we talk about what's appropriate. This was from this woman in Ethiopia who gives this water to her child. If you were had this water, you really would want something to treat it with that was a flocculant to take out all the dirt and was also a disinfectant to make it safe. And if you use pure on this water, you could turn it from very dirty looking water to crystal clear water. If you have a safe rural water supply already, if you have a pipe that's pretty safe, but as was mentioned earlier, is probably gonna get contaminated as you walk that water home and you keep it in your house and the chickens get into it, you might wanna add just a little bit of chlorine to keep it safe over time. If you are this family in rural Malawi, where next to your village every month you dig a new hole to access shallow groundwater, and the hole is just open and you put buckets down, and you have no access to the market or to consumable products, and really are outside the income um, of the community of the country, then maybe you'd want to use something like SOTUS, which is free and can be used at the community level. This is all contextual in order to figure out how to provide safe drinking water to people in rural areas. Um, one of my rants in public health is that every public health intervention that is ever done is a success, if you read the papers. Everything is, is perfectly successful and there's no problems. I actually think we learn a lot from our failures, and I have to say in public health we have a lot of them. And so one of the things I wanted to talk about is when does point of use, household level, water treatment not work? And the places I've really seen it not work are when there's poor product, inappropriate product or unconvinced users. I'll go through examples of those. Um, there was a study done in Zambia, which was a country that was using chlorination to treat water. And the study said that, um, showed that 42% of people said they were using the product when they went to their home. Okay, that's great. But that only 13% were confirmed with chlorine residual in their drinking water at the time of the visit. So there's always the people who lie to you when you interview them. And we expect a certain percentage of that. But this is a little higher. And I looked at these numbers and I'm like, is there enough chlorine in the product that's being distributed? And um, what was happening is they were using these old generators to make the chlorine. They were, it's a generator that you put salt and water um, together and then you flow electricity through it and you actually make chlorine. They were doing the project for five years and those generators had gone past their useful life. And instead of making 0.5% chlorine, they were now making 0.1 to 0.2% chlorine. So this is the reason for the disparity in the chlorine residual. Now in order to fix this, we really move to very stringent quality control. If you don't provide a product that works, there's no point in providing it. We also moved, instead of having these random kind of crappy generators in somebody's office in the corner, we hired a pharmaceutical company in the country to make the product who met ISO 9001 standards. Okay, inappropriate product. I got to CDC right after the US had gone into Afghanistan. And CDC being a US government organization, we get requests from Washington on a fairly regular basis. Um, so someone called down from Washington saying, there was a senator who in the Afghanistan recovery bill wanted to put in a water treatment unit and his friend made them and they wanted to send one to every community in Afghanistan. And what did we think of this? Of course, it lands on my desk because I'm the water treatment person. And this is the product. So it's a water treatment unit in a bucket that fits on a, pla on a pallet. Very important criteria. It has to fit on a pallet so you can ship it. It's a water treatment unit that includes a holding tank, a pump, a one micron bag filter, an ozonator, ozone contact tank, three micron filter, UV light, chlorine flow meter, chlorine contact tank, pump, another filter. Slightly complicated. So I looked at this and I said, the first thing in this system is actually a one micron filter. A micron's a millionth of a meter. If you have 
dirty water that you're filtering through that, that filter will clog in an instant. So I called this company and I said, where are you, what water do you treat, what's your goal here? They're like, well, we're in rural Alaska. We work with Native American communities in rural Alaska using glacier runoff water <laughs> in order to treat their water. I'm like, okay, what's the maximum turbidity that this system can take? They were very proud. And they said, one. <laughs> Now, just to give you a little bit of reference, that picture in the cup of that woman from Ethiopia, that's about 700. One is crystal clear water. And I turned to them and I said, you know, regularly we're working with people kind of on a regular basis, 600 is extreme, but we work with people that drink water of turbidity 5 to 100. And they said, no person in the world drinks water with that turbidity. So your product needs to be appropriate for the context. Okay, this is a fabulous street demonstration in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. So this is actually an uh, NGO, the people in the caps, um, who's doing uh, street demos with very, you can see, I don't have a pointer. You can see right there, bucket of dirty water. They're going to turn that bucket of dirty water clean. They've got demo, the demos in Creole, appropriate language, pictorial, fabulous street demo, bullhorn. They've got 200, 300 people around them watching this demo. Really great advocacy, really good work. Um, however, what they're promoting is the pure product, which is that flocculent disinfectant that turns dirty water clear. And this is the water that was available in the area they were promoting. This is water that could be treated with that treatment unit from the last slide. There's probably there's no turbidity in this water. Um, an interesting thing is that culture and behavior is incredibly important around water treatment practices. People have real strong preferences about what their water tastes and looks like. So there was a study done in Nepal, and they wanted to answer the question, which one do people in Nepal prefer the most? So they gave the same families four options. They gave them solar disinfection, they gave them chlorine, and they gave them ceramic and biosand filters. And they did a training at the beginning, and they said each family is going to use each one for two weeks then you tell me what you think. And during the training, the women came back to them and said, SOTUS won't work. They're like, what? SOTUS works. And it's like, no, it won't work. It makes the water hot, and hot water is bad. And so there was this perception, this cultural perception, that this treatment was actually making the water worse. And so if something is culturally inappropriate, you can either work to change the culture through education or move to another option. And changing the culture through education is quite difficult. And so you, this is something that needs to be taken into account when a program starts. Okay, so I'll move on a bit now to what makes household water treatment work um, and some of the successes we have seen. So this is a woman in rural Ethiopia who has walked to this water source um, and as she's walking to the water source, she has this ceramic container that she uses for um, storing the water in her house. She had it on her back as she was walking. She had a cloth on her back to protect her back from being bruised from the ceramic. And as I watched her collect this water from the source, it's, I don't know if you can see it, she took that cloth that she was using to protect her back and she put it over the lid of the ceramic container to filter this water through the cloth before she put it into her water. She knows this water isn't safe for her and her family. She's doing what she can, cloth filtration, to make it better. Now, cloth filtration is not going to help that much in this water, but it will help some, and she's doing it. And so if we can provide products that are this intuitive to use, that can be adopted into local custom, people will use them. So what do we need to do? First, that product has to work. It has to be a quality product that does the job it says it's going to do. There needs to be a way to get it to that person. I will say that more than anything else, this is a marketing and distribution problem than anything else. We're talking about, you know, at least a billion people. And often to move a product, there needs to be a financial reason to move it. So even if you take the product and give it away for free, to move it through a country, there needs to be incentive to get it through the distribution chain. Wholesalers, retailers, distributors, etc. So there may need to be profit involved in the distribution chain. You need behavior change communication to teach people how to use a product. And you need users to want to use it and adopt it. 
So I'll give one example of a product that we work. There's lots of examples, but I'll kind of focus on one. First, this is a picture of a local plastics company in Nairobi, Kenya, and they make bottles and caps, which are then shipped to a local um, chemical company, which fills those bottles with a chlorine solution. That bottle costs 14 US cents to make, it's a completely local product, and it treats 1,000 liters of water. You fill one cap into one jerry can, wait 30 minutes and drink. Now this product is branded, branded Water Guard, um, a little bit of an aspirational branding. Uh, Kenya speaks English, but also speaks Swahili and a few other mother tongue languages. Um, but Guard is Askari in um, Swahili, is a known word because many Kenyan men work as guards. And so it's a little bit, it's branded in English, but it's kind of cross-branded because guard is a known word in Swahili. Then it's distributed and marketed at a profit. So there's, um, there's everything from TV and radio to this branded kiosk. And then at the, at the kiosk level, it's sold. Now, the cost to get people to put it on their shelves doubles the price of the product. So it moves to 28 US cents when it's sold at the kiosk level. There's a couple cents profit at each step in the distribution chain. Then there's people who do behavior change communication around the product to encourage people to buy it. This is a product from, this is a program from CARE, an NGO based in the United States, where a woman is using the bottle of chlorine solution to kill the diarrhea that's lying at her feet, the men who have attacked her with diarrhea, and she's used the chlorine to kill them in street theater to teach people about where diarrhea comes from and how you prevent it. This is nurses, and nurses in the clinic are using the chlorine in a safe storage container to provide safe drinking water to their patients, as well as recommending to mothers who come in with children with diarrhea to go and purchase the water garden and use it. Now, me coming to someone and saying you should treat your water means next to nothing. Um, but someone who's respected in the community, like a nurse, telling someone that your child's sick and you can make your child healthier by treating your water is highly respected. We did an evaluation of patients who had seen these nurses. We followed up with them two weeks and one year after they had their appointment where they were recommended to use the chlorine. We found that two weeks after when we visited these households, 68% of the households had chlorine in their drinking water, which meant they'd gone out, They'd found the product in a kiosk, they'd bought it, they brought it home, and they were using it. They weren't given this product. Then, a year later, 71% of those households were still using the product. You target the people who need it with the message that comes from the person they trust. And that, mess that could be a nurse, that could be an imam, that could be, that could be whomever. What we're eventually looking for is sustained adoption and monitoring. We want to make sure that people use this over time until they are given access to water that's safe to drink from another source, such as pipe-treated infrastructure water, if that happens. This is a midwife in western Kenya who is using a chlorine solution to treat her water. You can see she has safely stored water with a cover and a, and a dedicated cup. And she also recommends to all her new mothers that they use um, household water treatment in order to make the water safe that their babies drink. And this is the kind of messaging that we're looking for. So I'll argue to make sustainable programs within household water treatment, you need three things. The first, you need a technologically verified product. There's a bit of this that's engineering. Get that right. The second thing you need is a cost-effective implementation strategy. You need to be able to deliver these products to people in a way that makes sense. And lastly, you need people who are demanding these products. If people won't use them, there's no point in giving them. And the sustainable programs, the programs we see that are really successful are when these three things come together. So this is a slide that um, looks at the estimated users of household water treatment products. And you can see that it's been increasing. The first bar graph is 2005, 2006, 2007. And that as of 2007, and I don't have my glasses on so I can't see the slide, there was um, just under 19 million people who were using household water treatment. 
Now, 19 million people sounds like a fabulous number. Isn't that wonderful? 19 million people, a huge number of people. Most of those are with chlorine. Some of them are with other products. Okay, let's go back. There's an estimated in 2000, there's all kinds of different numbers, but the, one of the 2000 numbers is 1.1 billion people without access to safe drinking water. We're looking for 60% coverage as a goal. And in when you put the graph on the scale of 1.1 billion, the people using household water treatment, you can barely see. This is a huge, huge problem. And little um, boutique programs, whether they may be wonderful and they may be very heartwarming, often don't actually make much of an impact. And the question is, how do we bring things to scale? How do we move from being boutique programs to something that actually has impact on a larger level? Oh, oh, this is just talking about the results that I already talked about with the uh, nursing program. Someone edited her slides well on the plan this morning. Um, I'll go on. So. I want to talk a teeny bit about behavior change because I think that's a it's a really interesting topic that often when you talk about water treatment and engineering doesn't really get get discussed. Um, so when a new in innovation comes out, behavior change is actually quite slow. Um, cell phones, mobile phones may be the counter example to this, but generally what happens is when something new comes out, like the um, new Apple iPhone, the early innovators and er the innovators and early adopters are the ones lining up outside the Mac store to buy it because they want to be the first ones. And they're the cool kids, and they're the ones that like, look, I got my new iPhone. And they're somewhere around kind of 2.5 to 13.5% of the population. You'll note that Mac has about a 10% market share. Um, but the question is not about how to get these cool kids, not how to get all these ado early adopters, but how do you break into the early and late majority? Because those are the people that give you scale. And they need to be convinced. How do you move from just the cool kids to everyone? And so that's where your social networks start playing. That's where your recommendations, your teachers, your nurses, your religious leaders, your friends, your peers. This is what it's like, you know, the iPhone's cool. You can do this. Oh, I really love the app that does this. I have to buy one. That's how you move into early and late majority. The last but the laggards, these are people that still don't wear their seatbelts. These are the people that still don't feel condoms work. They exist in every public health intervention. And we're never going to get to them. But if we can get to the other 84%, that's what we're going for. And this is really, when you look at, at things that are looking to change behavior, this is one of the behavior change models. There's others, but this is a nice one to present here um, that we really need to look at. And one of the things to think about is when you decentralize water treatment, instead of the responsibility being one or two people at the huge water treatment plant, you're actually decentralizing that wa responsibility to every family. There's many more points where it can fail. It is always better to do things centrally if possible. We're doing things at the household level only in contexts where it's not possible to do it centrally. Emergencies developing countries that don't have access to infrastructure as of yet. Um, failed states that don't look like they're going to get infrastructure anytime soon. You promote household level water treatment when there's no other option as a quick way to get the health gains associated with water treatment in as much of the population as you can. The next step is community level treatment, infrastructure, water treatment at a higher level where you don't depend on behavior change. You depend on someone whose job it is to show up every day and put the chlorine in the infrastructure system. And so water treatment at this level is kind of worst case, but we're doing it as a stopgap for health benefits. Um, one of the things I want to talk about is uh, there is a way forward with these programs. I think we need to think strategically to assess the programs to fix the failures, because there's lots of them. Keep an open mind. Based our research on implementation needs, there's a lot of research out there done in the academic community, I think, that, that shows, uh, that shows you know, academic arguments, such as, is sanitation or water better? And the reality is, we need both. What do we do? We need to think at scale, and we need to implement and pro fund proven technologies. And the key questions that we're looking at are, can we increase demand for improved water quality among the group in the highest need with the most diarrhea? Can we develop sustainable systems that provide point of use approaches to communities in those highest need? And can we reduce the burden of disease, particularly among the poorest who need it the most, with these approaches or not? 
And those are questions we really need to think about. I want to end here before I take questions and talk a little bit about teaching and, and curriculum around this. Um, this is a quote from an article I read that I really liked. It was about working in the emergency context. But it said, the notion that being humanitarian and doing good are somehow inevitably the same is a hard one to shake off. But it's often quite true that we can think we're doing good, but in fact be doing something that isn't. And we need to question ourselves in our programs at all times. Um, so I think I should have plenty of time for questions, I hope. Um, and I'm happy to take questions. I have, a, I have a technological question. Yeah. So with, so with the sodas, uh, yeah. so the sunlight and the plastic bottles, yep. uh, we read here in the United States that if you drink out of those plastic bottles long mm -hmm. enough and they sit out in the sun, chemicals from the plastic start to get into the water and it can create long-term health effects. Exactly. Is there any push to move toward glass bottles, which in theory would have the same UV benefits? And is that something that perhaps collecting glass bottles in the developed world and sending them to the developing world uh, could, could come in? Right, so a couple um, points on that. Uh, there's two chemicals we look at, phthalates and BPA in plastics. There is leaching in those plastics into water. There are long-term health effects from that. SOTUS has looked at how much leaches into the water, calculated out the cancer risk. There's all these risks associated with World Health. Currently, those levels are below what World Health considers acceptable, although plastics chemistry is, is very much emerging, and I wouldn't be surprised. Europe has already outlawed, or made illegal certain types of plastic containers that are still illegal or that are still legal in the states for holding drinking water. I think we'll see much more emerging about plastics and safety of storing water in plastics over time. Um, but as of right now, they're saying um, right now SOTUS meets World Health Organization standards. Now, there is a good question that comes from short-term benefits in terms of diarrheal disease reduction versus long-term um, drawbacks in terms of slightly increased cancer. Your cost benefit is something it's difficult to calculate that cost benefit analysis, but it does exist. And so there is something, do you do something that will save the lives of kids right now, even though you might have slightly increased risk of cancer in the future, to try and balance things out a little bit to get to the point where you can start having the luxury of, start of caring about long-term risks. And I think that's certainly what we saw in the history as the US has developed. Now, your point about glass is well taken. Glass would be much better. You still get all the UV benefits. Um, glass bottles are virtually non-existent, um, except for kind of Coca-Cola, and those are very valuable, and they're returned through the cycles. I think it would be a horrible idea to make them here and ship them to developing countries because of shipping costs. Supporting a local manufacturing of glass bottles specific for solar disinfection in a developing country I think would be a fabulous idea. And that's, that's something, because people make glass bottles because there's Coca-Cola everywhere still in glass. And so I wouldn't ship anything from here. I think that's often something people think. The, I was in Haiti after the quake for quite a long time. I cannot tell you the crap people sent down from their garage. And I'm like, last thing that needed to be on those planes. Um, so we need to um, think about how to do it locally, and that would be a great option. Yeah. Go for it. Oh, thank you. Um, you talked about the large-scale central infrastructure type changes that really are the ultimate goal, right. but um, the smaller scale options that you described are the lifesavers for the uh, more isolated areas where there are government problems, et cetera. Then you, uh, but you also described the Port-au-Prince situation that had the large scale, but you know, for maintenance and parts or, or the chlorination yeah. in that case. So how often? do you run into, or I is it typical that you have to go in with the small scale because the large scale can't be maintained? Or, and to, yeah. I'm just really curious about how you balance a, the, that kind of, uh, right. so those solutions. And that's a fabulous question, and I think that that's just as relevant for the U.S. context as it is for the developing world context. Because I've been at some conferences recently with um, U.S. water water treatment facility maintainers who are talking about how difficult it is to currently provide water that's treated to drinking water level to every person in the U.S. when they're using it to water their lawns, take showers, etc. And the reality is, is it more efficient in infrastructure systems? And I think this may happen more and more, and we're seeing it happen a little bit, where infrastructure water is for all your water uses, but your drinking water is your infrastructure water plus your Brita 
your infrastructure water plus some other treatment you do in the household level. I mean, how many people now own a Brita or something equivalent? How many people have changed that filter in the last three months? <laughs> That's the question I always ask when people say, it's easy to change a filter in the developing world every three months. Yeah, yeah. How many people do it here? <laughs> um, so I think that there's a fabulous question even here as to whether or not infrastructure as we have it currently designed is sustainable. We see that with lead in D.C., we see that with cryptosporidium in Milwaukee, we see that across the U.S., and we also see that the estimated amount, we need 100 million poured into our water systems in the next 10 years, EPA estimates, in order to make them work, just to keep them operational. We're not putting that money into them. Now, in the developing world, we ask many of the same questions, but it becomes an access issue because not everybody in the developing world has access to infrastructure systems. And how much are you aiming to meet these high Western standards versus aiming to get people enough water and then getting them some way to make that water safe for drinking? And I think it's a hard question in every country. There's some countries that have fabulous water supply, but I mean, Egypt is a is a huge receiver of U.S. donor funds um, because of the, um, the accords. Part of the um, peace accords meant that Egypt and Israel would receive quite a bit of funding from, for both countries for a long time. And Egypt has put a ton of that money into building these gorgeous water treatment facilities in Egypt. And um, we were there looking at a typhoid investigation. And what we found is because they use Nile water, they can only pump water through those systems two hours a day. They just don't have enough water to pump through, and that means there's reverse negative pressure in the pipes, which means um, that when the water isn't being pushed, because what you want to maintain in an infrastructure system is so water flows through the pipes. If there's a break in the pipe, you want enough pressure that goes out so that nothing comes in and contaminates. And what was happening is you, had, you didn't, weren't maintaining pressure in Egypt in these gorgeous facilities, and things were coming in and contaminating. And part of the Muslim water context is that you share water in hot environments. It's, it's a religious, it's a duty. And so in Egypt, where it's very hot, people have these containers of water outside their houses. And they, those are meant for travelers. Those are meant for people wandering by in the desert. And those containers of water were contaminated and transmitting typhoid. And so even in places with a ton of money, like Egypt, with all the money in the world to do this right, they couldn't. Um, the U.S. is having problems, the developing world. I think we really need to focus on infrastructure. We cannot stop focusing on infrastructure because water supply is so critical, especially in the megacities. But whether or not we try and make that drinking infrastructure water drinkable is a fascinating discussion. I don't know if I answered your question or... Okay. Um, I have a quick question. I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I was wondering if you were familiar with the exhibition called Design for the Other 90%. Yes. And if you might be able to comment on some of the products um, that were in that exhibition uh, and that catalog, which is still available, which um, for those of you who don't know, the Design for the Other 90% was an exhibition at the Cooper Hewitt Museum, yeah. I believe. And um, it, it, the catalog is a great document because it gives a lot of great information about how to make a successful product, but also examples of products that didn't work. Um, so if you have Which, any comments. Do you have one specific? Because I know. I was thinking of um, maybe the life straw yeah, and life also straw. the big the wheel, the um, that, that giant wheel that you would put the water in and roll it along with a rope. Oh, yeah. That, the one that didn't yeah, work. Got it. <laughs> um, so the design for other 90%, remember the slide I put up with the five options that have been proven to reduce disease? Um, when the design for the other 90% came to, they kind of picked their interventions before they talked to many people. And one of the interventions they picked was ceramic filtration, which is a fabulous option. It's, um, it's proven to reduce disease, proven to um, reduce the microbes. You make them locally. The issue with ceramics is that worldwide, worldwide right now, we have 31 ceramics filter factories that make 24,000 filters a month which means we don't have a lot of coverage. 24,000 families a month isn't that big. The issue we have right now is trying to scale those up and get production up. But that's an issue that's solvable, and that's something we should move forward with. Now, the other intervention that Design for the uh, 90% picked was um, Life Straw. Who's heard of the Life Straw? Yeah, everybody has. So um, Vestigard Franson is a company out of Europe that revolutionized the malaria bed net um, world. So I often, I have a slide in some of my presentations that uh, explains why water is so complicated and malaria is so easy and why malaria gets so much more funding. Malaria is a bug, a mosquito. I have one that, a flash that makes it fly. And then it causes one disease by one organism 
It's a protozoa that gets in your blood, you know, malaria. And to prevent that disease, you sleep under a bed net. And if you get 80% of people in your community sleeping under a bed net, because the mosquitoes that transmit malaria only bite at night, um, if you get 80% of people in your um, community sleeping under those bed nets, you've got uh, what's called the halo effect, because it kills all the malaria breeding mosquitoes in the community. Right, I just explained to you how to prevent malaria in about 30 seconds, and there's billions of dollars going on to providing bed nets to every person in the developing world, and it's looking like it might happen pretty soon. Now, water, I think I did a 45 minute presentation, you're all probably confused. Um, so, I think this is one of the reasons we see that water is not a solvable problem. Okay, so you take this company that that revolutionized mosquito bed nets and made them so that they're long lasting, you don't have to retreat them. Very successful textile company. They say, we've solved the malaria problem, we're gonna solve water. They think something up at night, one night, their CEO who has no background in water, takes some filter cloth, wraps it in a thing, puts it in a straw, and says, we'll get all these people to drink through this straw full of filter cloth and we'll use iodine. And we'll use iodine at a level that is 100 times the level allowed by World Health Organization. How long are you allowed to use iodine? Who knows? Who hikes? What's the longest time you're allowed to use iodine and why? Nobody hikes here. Yes. What? It's two weeks. Why can you not use iodine longer than two weeks for water treatment? It impacts your thyroid and causes hyper and hypothyroidism depending on the level. Peace Corps cohorts given a... Uh, iodine for two years or how we know this. We don't give Peace Corps workers iodine anymore. Um, so they took something, they did a hundred times what was allowed at the World Health Organization level, a uh, World Health Organization for two weeks and they told people to use that continuously. And a few of us who know a bit about water treatment talked to the CEO one day and he said, what? Iodine's not approved? Everybody treats iodine with, uh, drinking water with iodine. They've now redesigned it. They, a friend of mine did a study on it. I, I don't know how you feel, but you see all these pictures about life straw of these women who are in a river like this, sucking through a straw. How many um, women do you know that are comfortable in that position? How, how safe, how, how, um, how polite is that to do, with particularly in more conservative societies where women aren't supposed to be like that, hiking up their skirts? Yeah, so it's, the, and the other thing is in the developing world, water is often maintained communally. You have a family water pot. So having an individual intervention is just really cross-culturally inappropriate. Now they've since developed the life straw, they've since moved on with a new version that doesn't poison people with iodine, and they've then also developed a family filter, which is essentially the same life straw, but it has a tube, and it has a thing up top where you pour water into the top and it goes through the tube through gravity and goes through the filter, and it comes out into a glass. Um, there's issues with that one still. Their first design was the rats eating the tubing in the Congo, which is what I mentioned earlier. Um, and it also, currently they are advertising it as a turn the tap on and it fills your glass. It makes 100 milliliters a minute currently. Who has a sense of what that means? This is a, this is, what is this, 250 mils? This is 251 mils. It fills 40% uh, of this bottle in a minute. That's a little slow. So they've still got some redesign to go. They're getting better. Um, they're listening, at least now, about the iodine. Um, but this is one of those examples where this is the one of these you guys have heard about on the news because their press is stunning. And this is one of those examples of don't always believe what you see out of the development reporting because Lifestyle was actually a really difficult product for a long time. But it's the one you see. Yeah. Uh, you've worked a lot with teachers. Do you have any suggestions for yeah. activities that the teachers can do with their students or yeah. how to present these materials? Exactly. Um, one of the things that we do quite a bit is we have kind of one-page fact sheets on each of the options, and it's real easy to kind of divide kids up into groups. And like one group does ceramic filtration and researches it, one group does chlorination. It's also really easy to do simple things in the classroom, like even with just the styrofoam cups where you take a styrofoam cup and you put some food coloring in some water, you run it through sand and you see how long it takes the food coloring out. You can um, do all kinds of, like make an oil, a very timely topic right now, um, put oil in water in a aluminum pie pan and give, peop give kids the options that we're still using the same stuff, give them a straw to suck it out, give them some soap to disperse it, give them some um, 
pipe cleaners to catch it, like booms. So there's all kinds of kind of hands-on, I know the level you guys are teaching at is kind of K through college, and so it would be different. Um, you could look at a particular community that is of interest in your, um, in your classroom, if you happen to be in a classroom with a lot of Haitians, you could look at investigating the earthquake and what might be appropriate responses in the earthquake. You could look at kind of hands-on examples of how would you respond, what would you do, what are the benefits and drawbacks, who's doing what. Um, did that, I can keep going, I think, or, um, but mostly, I think it would really depend on the level of the students, and there's a lot of research out there on the web on each of these. So there's everything from peer-reviewed papers and you know, comparing the evidence base to just little pictures of different models. And it's not that hard to do this in the classroom. Like It'd be trivial to get some plastic bottles and put them in the sun and see if it reduces the microbiology with Charles River water in Boston. You know, If you've got a micro lab, it'd be trivial to look at the chlorine residual you can measure with a pool test kit measure the chlorine residual of the drinking water coming out of the tap with a $5 pool test kit or a $300 meter if you have a spectrophotometer. Mm -hmm. Kind of depends on the level of the classroom. Yeah, so right. I think there's a lot of, you can go micro, you can, I've seen teachers do um, outbreak investigations where they give a certain percentage of the group, like I would give you all cards and say you've got the outbreak and everybody has to work together to figure out what transmitted. So you can do outbreak investigations around diarrhea. You can do kind of the water quality, the micro, the chemistry. You can do the development option selection. You can pick an emergency or a context and think about what might be appropriate. Talk about the benefits and drawbacks between them. To follow up on that, Chicago, uh, our Metropolitan Wastewater Reclamation District does not chlorinate our water. Uh, does not chlorinate the wastewater effluent, which is what's in the Chicago oh. River. So you can do a very good local experiment here of using the same exact process with Chicago River water to test whether or not the UV radiation, which is the process they're actually considering instead of chlorination, uh, works here. That's so very easy. Just go down to the river, fill up some bottles, and go from there. Yeah. Don't drink the water. <laughs> I think you're a really good person to ask about. A lot of schools are doing projects where they're raising money with their students to yes. give back to a project somewhere. And I think, you know, there's always confusion like, where do we give? Like, where is the money going to be, you know, most efficiently used? Or do you have any suggestions for teachers that might want to start programs like that? Often, what I say to people who are raising, and I don't mean this disparagingly, but this is often small money. This is maybe a thousand, couple thousand. If you give to an organization like MSF, um, Doctors Without Borders, which is a fabulous organization to donate to, you feel like their annual budget is in the hundreds of millions of dollars, and your thousand, you aren't going to get much back from your thousand because you, they won't send you anything. They'll send you a thank you card. But it's kind of a drop in the bucket for their, I, I mean, I can always recommend the big organ, they're great big organizations that do amazing work. Um, Doctors Without Borders is definitely one of them. But um, what I say for people who are trying to raise more local money with a more, where you want a hands-on touch, I would say go to the projects that people in your community are doing. So the Rotary Clubs, churches, um, whatever community groups are there. Every Rotary Club in the U.S. is now supposed to do a developing world water project. Um, every Catholic church in Haiti is paired with a Catholic church in the U.S. These local networks very much exist, and I think that by reaching out to some of the more local networks where you have much more of a personal touch, it feels like your money both goes further and you get more back from donating that money. And I would say assess those programs, because often those rotary programs or those church programs are quite terrible. There, I have a friend who makes a filter, and I have a friend who works in this country, and I think this country needs this filter, and they're completely wrong. But they're often they're quite good as well. And so I would say investigate your local resources to see what project you'd want to support, be it literacy or water or um, any type of thing, and go from there. I mean, and certainly I can make recommendations on, on large organizations as well. But I, I think that for students, you want that local touch and you want those pictures. There's also things like Engineers Without Borders, if you're interested in water supply. I don't, there must be an Engineers Without Borders chapter somewhere in Chicago. Um, they do a lot of water supply projects. So there's different, there's different local groups, and, and linking into your local context will get you there. Yeah. 
I just I wanted to ask, do you have you ever found that either uh, media attention or even funding for something like uh, you know high profile malaria, their goals have run counter to c providing clean water to a community? I was struck by a, an article that, that where they summarily dismissed the efforts to preserve wetlands in Uganda. Um, that were unfortunately breeding the Anopheles mosquito. Right. I think I've seen a couple things that are really unfortunate. Um, one example, I was in uh, Bolivia and they had a fabulous water treatment plant in Bolivia that they shut down and sent people back to their normal sources, uh, surface water sources for collecting water because there was a chemical in the drinking water that they couldn't remove in the water treatment plant to the German standards which they were using, but did remove it to the World Health Organization standards which weren't considered good enough. The German standards are based on the precautionary principle and are much tighter. And it seemed very unfortunate to me. It, I, I talk a lot about incremental improvements. Yes, it's you. It, increase your exposure to BPA if you use water from sodas, but if you're incrementally improving child diarrhea, that's a risk probably worth taking until you can then care about that next risk. And I think it, it's highly unfortunate when we take things like the German water quality standards, which literally are the tightest on the planet, and try and apply them in rural Bolivia and then force people back to sources. So I see that happen quite a bit, that kind of which standard do we use? And that's a tough question. That's an ethics question. But um, what I more see, like the wetland example I'm not f as familiar with, what I more see is people claiming one disease in children is worse than the other, like malaria is worse than diarrhea, ARI is worse than that, HIV trumps, um, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that really what I would like to promote is moving toward integrated child health management, which is trying to, uh, the whole health of the child, it's not one disease that trumps anything else. And I think that's where some of the programs are moving now. Um, I'm trying to think of other water, I mean, there's a great program that Carter Center runs to reduce guinea worm, and the way they teach people to reduce guinea worm is they teach people to take a, a filter and, pour and filter their water but guinea worm is huge, it's like 100 microns big, so the filter is really coarse. And we often are just, we often like, if you could just do like a, a slightly smaller filter, you'd also reduce diarrhea. But they're eradication people, and I think they have a really specific goal, which is to eradicate a specific disease. So do you water down this vertical intervention, which is very successful, Carter Center's guinea worm, and they're about to eradicate guinea worm. Do you water that down by also trying to address diarrhea, or do you let them eradicate guinea worm and then move on from there? And that's, again, a, an interesting, there's no right answer to a lot of these questions. We have time for one more question. Sorry. I have two questions, but they're related. <laughs> OK. Um, there's different levels of water usage. And unfortunately, in this country, we use our highest quality drinking water for everything else. Yes. So question number one is, when you go to other countries, do you train people or do you try and educate them about the use for drinking versus washing down food equipment? And then I think our school is going to be getting these rain barrels. There's a number yeah. of us we talked about it. And um, we'd like to use gray water more in our school. So could you talk a little bit more about that so we don't get anything that's unsafe? But I think it's a, it's a step yeah. we can take. Thank you. Right, of course. Um, so the first thing is, uh, in the areas we're promoting household level water treatment, the amount of water that's used per family per day tends to be between 20 liters and about 80 liters because they're collecting it in 20 liter jerry cans. 20 liters is five gallons. So you're talking a whole different level of water use. Like these are people who are walking hours. I just worked in Sudan and the average number of hours the family walks per day to get water is four. And you could do, there's every, I mean there's states on every end of the spectrum here, it's not mandated at the national level right now. Please join me in thanking Danielle and Tay.